loading as well. And just for the purposes of our editor, please give us your um, first name and your family name and spell. My name is Faiz, that's F-A-I-E-Z, and my surname is Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N. Yeah. And your designation? Medical I'm a medical doctor. doctor. Yeah, I'm a medical that's doctor. Anything else you want to put there for the sake of this, or would you rather not? Uh, no, I think just medical doctor. Medical, medical doctor. doctor, yeah. Um, so the A is close as possible to the name, please, sir. Okay, sir, so thank you. I can take always with me. Um, and please give us a brief background of yourself. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, um, as I said, my name is Faiz Kirsten. I'm a medical doctor. I qualified way back in 1985, I think it was. And I, was, I worked in the state service for one or two years, and then I was in my own practice for almost 10 years, not far from here, down the road in Athlone, in Belgravia Road, general practitioner. I wanted to specialize in surgery, um, actually try to get a position on the uh, ophthalmology rotation at Hurtasi Hospital, but I was told to wait four years before I could get on. And in the meantime, because I was running a general practice, I had become interested in business because that's what it is. Basically, I found out after a while, you're just basically running a business. So I was interested in practice management and I thought, I need to do something to uh, understand how business works. And I came across this qualification called uh, an MBA. I didn't know much about it, but I sort of applied for, for, the, for a place on the, uh, uh, at the business school and they accepted me <laughs> and so I did an MBA uh, for two years part-time and that was an amazing experience. I learned stuff I had never known before. Absolutely gave me a completely new perspective on how the world works actually. And so there I was, you know, a medical doctor with a business qualification. And in the meantime, I, you know, we were wanting to look at how to change the uh, environment in which doctors were practicing because things were just getting out of control at the time that I was practicing and, and, and basically they're still not the best environment to, to work in as a doctor today. Financially? Uh, yeah, for doctors financially, uh, for the patients, um, things are completely dysfunctional and we looked at how could we sort of make things more functional in, in, for, in healthcare for doctors specifically and for the patients. And we were looking at sort of setting up these multidisciplinary clinics. We sort of provide all these services under one roof. You know, we had all these different strategies. But we we're looking for funding. And uh, lo and behold, a company uh, at the time, a BE company said, look, we're doing something very similar. Um, we'll fund your projects, and, but you've got to come on board. And so they invited me on board. And uh, on one hand, it was the worst decision of my life. <laughs> and on the other hand, it was... Uh, a good, a good decision because I learned so much, even though I ended up you know, in an acrimonious situation with that company. Um, I learned a heck of a lot. And uh, when I left the company, first of all, and went to court, you know, what, what I learned about corporations was quite astounding. Because I thought going to court that, in fact, the directors owed me money, but in fact, it turned out that the corporation owed me money. And <laughs> the corporation actually ended up not paying me any money. And so I decided, how does that work? Because I was dealing with individuals, and, um, but a corporation was the entity that owed me money. Uh, <laughs> and we can talk about corporations you know, a little later on if you want to. But I was more interested in the leadership aspect, because at, during the MBA, I actually uh, did my thesis on corporate culture. Uh, in fact, it was entitled, The Effect of Mergers and Acquisitions on um, uh, Organizational Climate uh, and Culture. And also, I added financial performance to that, to the thesis, and I was marked down because of that <laughs> by the external professor. Uh, you know, uh, he marked me down. I still got a first grade pass, but he marked me down quite a few percentage points because he said, we didn't ask you to do that. We didn't ask you to, to also research financial performance, mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> and well, maybe for him, I think, but not for me, because I learned a heck of a lot, you know, by doing that. But anyway, what I was interested in leadership because I had done this thesis on culture, and so when I left this company, I sort of started researching leadership. And um, because on the MBA, they taught us leadership. I did the leadership module, but to me, it was very, it wasn't sufficient. And so I looked at leadership from a biological perspective when I left the company. And what I discovered was quite mind-boggling. It was new research that had come out, new research findings. Very few people knew about this. But to me, it was most amazing. 
the stuff that I learned about leadership. And I also developed an online tool to measure different leadership skills, which is still available. But this research sort of was something that sparked something in my mind, and I started researching a whole lot of other things over the next few years. I started researching stress, elimination, optimal health and wellness, corporate culture I did. Wrote a few books, wrote a few programs also on these different subjects. The subconscious mind was a big one, uh, which I basically researched and discovered many, many things as to how we, why we are the way we are as human beings and also why the world is the way it is today. And the world experiences many, many problems actually. Sorry guys, we're going to have to sit in the future. Where's he going to sit? I'll take him up. I think I have too much noise. He's, he's not, he doesn't, I must be... Yeah, yeah. Justified. Yes, so I could let him have a sit on his lap. He's scratching and... If I use a scratching himself, I'm not getting into it. I don't see you scratching, but I hear the sound. That sounds immediately are associated with you because you, you're a really? visual. Really? Okay. Whatever he's heard is associated wow. directly with you. So, wow. So, for example, in the city, you know, if yeah. you have pneumatic drills in the background, same thing, or in a um, nature location, yeah. you have a waterfall going, but you don't see it. Yeah. And I'm like, it's wonderful. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Something feels wrong. Wrong, yeah. yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, no problem. And you're still learning leadership. Yes, so I did all these different, uh, I studied and researched these various areas, like I mentioned, you know, from the subconscious to goal achievement to uh, corporate culture, leadership, etc., optimal health and wellness. And as I said, I wrote some books and I, I wrote some programs. And, and I set up an institute. In fact, I worked on a cruise ship at one stage and I was sitting in my cabin one day. And I wondered, how do I get all this information out to people? It was such valuable information. I'd applied a lot of the stuff to my own life. And I mean, I saw amazing changes in my own life. I lost a lot of weight and people started looking younger and people say, what's going on with you? you know? <laughs> One day we were actually in the Kango Caves and a woman said to, to her husband, we're standing in a queue. And she said to her husband uh, in Afrikaans, she said, uh, And I was actually with my daughter. <laughs> and when we got a bit further on along the way, my daughter said to me, Dad, I'm not going with you anywhere ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, because I applied it in my own life, you know, I thought I needed to tell people about this. And I was sitting in my cabin one day, and, and I thought, you know what? When I get back home, I'm going to start something called the Brain Science Academy. Because a lot of this research was actually based on brain science. And um, I got back home, and I set up the Brain Science Academy, but... It turned out to be the wrong name because people thought I was a brain scientist, you know, <laughs> not the fact that the research was based on brain science. And so I changed the name to the Health, Wellness and Performance Institute. And basically that's where I am at now at the moment. I'm not sort of fully practicing medicine. I'm sort of trying to create an awareness for the, uh, the Health, Wellness and Performance Institute, which I think is really needed if you're going to solve this healthcare crisis. What is really needed is education. That's what's really needed. And so it's really an educational institute to try and give people the knowledge that they require to optimize their health and wellness and uh, their performance also. It's called the Health, Wellness and Performance Institute. Um, yes, and besides, of course, also working on the National People's Convention now at the moment because that is a really important issue that everybody really needs to know about is the convention. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about that. Hang on, sorry, just before mm. we go into that, can we talk? So you practiced as a doctor, as a medical doctor for... I practiced as a medical doctor for... For many years, actually, um, I was in almost 10 years in my own practice in, in, in Belgravia Road, in Athlone. Then I worked in the company, as I said, and then I went overseas. I lived in Ireland for a while. I, I sort of worked as a doctor in Ireland. I came back, I did a bit of business, business consulting, went back into practice. Then I worked for five years in trauma and emergency at the hospital here in Claremont, a private hospital. Mm -hmm. Trauma and emergency at night, and during the day I would do all my, my research, basically, write programs, write books. And then I set up an office in Claremont, to set up the Health, Wellness and Performance Institute. Uh, but because it's such a radical new paradigm in terms of healthcare delivery, because people are used to disease management. They're not used to uh, doing things to optimize their health and wellness. So basically we, pro we program just to do nothing until we get sick and then we go to the doctor and the doctor gives us something to try and get better again. And that's the basic paradigm we live in. Whereas I'm saying, you know, if you want to solve the healthcare crisis, which the world is faced with today, and everybody's trying to solve it from different perspectives, different angles, and everybody's sort of uh, blaming each other, uh, whether it's the health minister or 
the private sector, the doctors, what everybody has their own perspective on it. For me, it's just two really two issues that are involved here. One is the corporatization of healthcare and basically of business and in fact of everything in the world today. That's the one issue. The other issue is the subconscious mind. People are programmed with beliefs that are making them not do what they need to do to optimize their health and wellness. And so uh, those are the two main issues, basically, yeah. yeah. So that leads us on to your discovery of the root cause of this health crisis. Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, we'll come to the root cause. I think that's the one issue. And then the healthcare crisis, we'll talk about that. But if you can, maybe I can maybe just touch on this thing called a corporation. What is corporatization of healthcare? What is a corporation? Uh, in fact, the whole world works on, on a corporatization basis, if I can put it that way. Everything is a corporation, so to speak. Everything is a business. Um, and so when I went to the business school, this thing that really flummoxed me was, entity, was an entity called a legal entity. I couldn't really understand it. For a few weeks, it just couldn't make sense to me. It was something that existed. It was artificial, but it existed. But at the same time, it didn't really exist. And it really only existed in the minds of the legal fraternity. They basically created this thing out of nothing, it said it exists, but it doesn't really exist, and it was created for certain purposes. Uh, to facilitate the workings of the law, I suppose. But the common man in the street, the general man in the street, doesn't really understand what a corporation is. If you ask even a professional person who doesn't do business on a daily basis, what is a corporation, they, they, they find it difficult to answer that question. Uh, because if you look at the definitions, there's many different definitions of it. In fact, Black's Law Dictionary describes it as, as a organization, a group of people who has a different personality to each individual person. I mean, that's not, that's not what it is really. That's not the right definition. Because a corporation is an entity that is separate from human beings. It's not human beings. It's an artificial person. And human beings are not artificial. Uh, we're natural people. We're natural persons, okay? N not persons. We're natural men and, and women, basically flesh and blood, living, breathing. A corporation is a dead entity. So a, corpor a thing, it's, 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 it's not something that, that's alive. So it's not human beings. Uh, so Black's Law Dictionary describes it as a group of people, an organization, which has a personality separate to individual people. But that's not true. An organization is actually a group of people who've come together, human beings, to achieve a certain objective. And, they, and it does have a personality that's called the corporate culture. Corporate culture is the personality of an organization, which is a group of people working towards a common goal, right? But that's not a legal entity, you see? <laughs> you see, a legal entity is something that exists only in the minds of the legal fraternity. And we are all enforced to follow this thing called, or obey what this legal entity, this corporation says we must do. So if the corporation says you must pay interest on a loan, even if the scriptures tell you not to pay interest, and it's actually prohibited and sinful to consume interest, pay interest, have anything to do with interest, uh, but the corporation says you must, then in fact we actually follow what the corporation says, we obey the corporation rather than the scriptures. And so in essence I found out that in fact a corporation, it can't be nothing, because you can't obey nothing and you can't sue nothing and nothing can't, can sue you. So when they say it doesn't exist and exists at the same time, that's an impossibility. There's something called mutual exclusivity. Mutual exclusivity means that one thing excludes another. The two can't exist at the same time. They can't be both be true at the same time. I can't be dead and alive at the same time. That's impossible. So my being, mutually, uh, my being alive excludes me being dead, you see? So a an, an, an corporation can't exist and not exist at the same time. And so I insisted what I needed to find out what is a corporation. Does it exist or doesn't it exist? Okay, they said it does exist. So if it does exist, what is it? You see, what exactly is it? Don't tell me it's something that exists as a belief system because belief systems exist within human beings. And we just said a corporation is separate from human beings, so it's not a belief system. So what is it then, you see? Uh, and a lot of people, even professors will, will sort of hum and haw in trying to answer your question. Eventually, I found out that basically what it is is just a document. It's words on paper, really, that's what it is. Like your ID book, your birth certificate, it's words on paper. It's basically, that's what it is. So basically, we as human beings are obeying a dead document rather than what the Creator tells us to do. And so in essence, we basically, the whole world is really, if, if you really think about it, we're basically worshipping idols, which is a dead document, really. Idol worship is worshipping something dead. It's a creation of the Creator. <laughs> yes, and we've all been forced to do that without many times in our thinking, just doing what everybody else tells us to do, or the law tells us to do. And if we don't do it, we get into a lot of trouble. And that's where common law comes in. Because statutory law is statutes made by human beings. Human beings have created these statutes, 
really to promote and, and, and foster the corporate agenda, I think, largely. And the corporate agenda, by and large, by and large, what it really wants to do is maximize profit. That's what it wants to do. It wants to make as much money as possible, regardless of the consequences. So whether people die in the process, they get sick, they, the world is destroyed, it doesn't really matter to a corporation because it has no life, it has no soul, it has no feeling, it doesn't care, it's dead but it wants to make as much money as possible for its shareholders. So what's the difference between a company and a corporation? Well, you see, you can actually buy a company. Have you ever heard of a shelf company? So when you buy a shelf company, what are they doing? They're taking a company off the shelf. Something that somebody else has created already on yes. paper. On paper. And they're selling it to you. It's a, a company is a corporation, really. So you must distinguish between a corporation and an organization. That's a big distinction. An organization is human beings, people, flesh and blood, a group of them. That's an organization. A corporation is separate from that. It's not an organization. It's an artificial entity. And if you look at the synonym for artificial, you'll be shocked at what the synonyms are. The synonyms are things like deceptive, non-natural, fictitious, man-made. Uh, the one that uh, really grabs me is deceptive. So it's a deceptive entity. <laughs> and really, that's what it is. A corporation is a deceptive entity. It's there to deceive. Now, a lot, a lot of people won't agree with me, but that's just my perception. No, but this is it, because you say corporation, and mm. people think mm. people. They think people. How's that dark? Can you explain that? Um, so yeah. I this yeah. yeah. Can I can do some water? Please, yeah. please. Whenever you want to do that, try and have a natural sort of environment. You know, okay. So okay. This stage, so it looks like you're mm. human as opposed to this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 cool. How is the dog not bothering you? Why would he? I'm not picking it up anymore. Really? Oh, that's microphone. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Sorry about that. No problem. So, um, yeah, so corporations are not, they're not flesh and blood human beings. That's one thing we must really understand. When they talk about a corporation, they're not talking about flesh and blood human beings. That is separate. They're two separate entities. You and I are human beings. We're flesh and blood. We, live, we are alive. We're breathing, um, living entities, right? A corporation is really just a dead thing, okay? So the fact that we're actually obeying these corporations, obviously there's people behind the corporations, and that comes from Roman Curia. All corporations are formed under Roman Curia. That's the Roman church administrative law, canon law, basically, in a sense. So that's how corporations were formed in the Roman era, basically. And so we think the Roman Empire is basically dead and buried. No, the Roman Empire is very much alive today, ruling the world, really, without people really understanding that they are. So, um, yes, um, so we must distinguish between an organization and a corporation. Very important to distinguish between the two. Okay, so now the next point I want to bring up is... Um, but then hang on, couldn't mm. you say that a company is an organization because it has people that... Yes, a comp well, uh, ordinary people think a company is a, is, is a group, is the people working in, in, the, in the company, right? It, you know, this is all terminology. In law, ter you know, words mean, words are very important. So, for example, if they say understand doesn't mean what you and I take the word understand to mean. Understand actually means in legalese, which is a English for a lawyer speak, <laughs> it means do you stand under my authority, okay, not do you comprehend me. So, so what the man in the, in, in the street understands by the word understand is not what a lawyer understands the word understand to mean, okay. So I don't know if, I, if that was clear. Um, so understand for me and you means comprehend. For the lawyer it means do you stand under my authority or for a police officer or someone like that, yeah. So language is very important. So the word company then, when you say I'm working for this company, means I'm working for this group of people who work in this company. I mean, I did my thesis on organizational culture, climate and financial performance in mergers and acquisition. So that was dealing with the human aspect of a company. Let's call it that, which is the organization. And that has a certain personality, which is called the culture. The culture is different to a corporation. So in another sense, a company is not the people. So if you buy a shelf company, you're not buying any people. You're buying a document which they take off a shelf and give it to you. That's what you're buying. Words on paper, a document. So that's the company from that perspective, you see. So that's the difference. Language is important. Terminology is important, yeah. So how can a person safeguard themselves from being fooled from this point onwards? 
Being fooled. Uh, we've been deceived for a long, long, long time. Deception is built into the system. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important for people to understand that we're living in a world of deception, really. And Although you mustn't be suspicious of everything, it's a good idea to put a good meaning to things until you come across evidence to the contrary, because otherwise you'll just be suspecting everything and everybody, you know, and you can't live your life like that. But we, you must understand we are living in a world of deception, and things are often not what you think they are. They turn out to be exactly the opposite to what you think they are. And so education, people need to do their own research, they need to be educated, they can... Um, talk to people who know, uh, get to know about the National People's Convention, which is coming up on the 29th of April to the 1st of May, and then beyond that, uh, where they learn a lot about what we're talking about, corporations, common law, the difference between that and civil law. Um, Can you tell us a bit more about the, the People's Convention? Just yeah, in a nutshell? yeah the, the People's Convention is really uh, an event to, to set up the... Um, common law in South Africa, okay? We want people, you see our constitution allows for common law to be used in South Africa, but we basically forced to follow statutory law and, 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 the, and the justice system really, they're more concerned about statutory law. They don't want to have any, they don't want to know about common law. So they don't really concern themselves with that. But the people are, the constitution allows us to develop the common law. And so we need to take the bull by the horns. We need to take responsibility for setting up common law and making it become part of what we want to be governed by. Um, common law is actually God's law, it's natural law, it's common sense law, it's, it's, what, it's common sense to you and me. Statutory law is oftentimes nonsensical, if you really think about it, because it's man-made. Okay? What's the most common example, or the, the best example of a common law that everyone would know and understand? <clears throat> Do no harm. Don't harm anybody. You wouldn't want to, it's simple. Do unto others what you would like to have them do unto you. So if I don't want somebody to harm me, I shouldn't do anything to harm the next person. That's the common law, and that's in the scriptures. Do not harm anybody. Do not steal. Cause no loss. If you steal from somebody, you're causing a lot of loss to that person. Okay? So don't cause any loss. Do not impede the freedom of other people. We all want to be free. We think we're free today. We, have a, we think we vote and we're politically free. But in essence, we're really enslaved. We're financially enslaved, economically enslaved. We're actually economic slaves, really, if you think about it. And that's how this, the... Uh, the banking, the financial system is actually designed to enslave people through the debt-based system. And so that's, again, your banks are all corporations. They need to make as much money as possible, even if they have to defraud you. And that's what happens with banks. We've discovered that, in fact, that we can talk about it at some point if you want to, about how banking loans actually work, how the financial system actually works. And, um, and all of these cases are going to be heard at the National People's Convention, which is really there also to set up something called the Unified Common Law Grand Jury of South Africa, which is a people's court, to hear all these cases that have been happening over the last while now, where people are losing their homes, losing their positions because of the fraud that is taking place in the banking sector, in the financial sector. Uh, if you go to court, you'll find that there's a lot of collusion between, between the judiciary and, and, and the legal fraternity. And it's not just us that has evidence of this. I mean, across the world, there's enough evidence now to show that there is collusion. So going to, to your normal statutory courts, let's call them that, and thinking you're going to win, most of the time you're going to lose. Most of the time you're going to lose. And so we need a people's court to basically hear these matters, because that, that'll be a fair court if the jurors themselves are impartial. That's important. You've got to get the right jurors in, okay? Uh, that is an issue. But if we have the right jurors, people who are fair, people who are impartial, understand what's going on, and then we'll have a fair court, okay? And that's called the People's or the Unified Common Law Grand Jury. That's the only way, really, we're going to get justice, you know, done properly in South Africa and, and in other parts of the world also. So they are viewing then the cases before them from a common law perspective, not from a financially driven, corporatized, statutory law. This is the, con the grand jury. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Purely Can you based say on that common in your law. Own word, please? Just kind of repeating the question in your own words, because we can't use his voice in the. Yes, edit. yes, yes. Uh, the, the unified common law grand jury, as the name suggests, you know, is is a grand jury process based on common law, which is God's law, natural law. Okay, uh, it's our it's involves our God-given rights, basically. We have certain inalienable rights as human beings, and it uses those laws to ensure that our rights are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We basically, those rights are ensured, protected, basically, yes. And so, uh, 
it is based on common law. The grand jury is based on common law. And people really need to get behind the convention, get behind the setting up of the grand jury, so that we can get justice done. Because if you lose, listen to some of the cases that are, where people have lost their homes, it's horrific. I mean, absolutely horrific. And as I said, a corporation has no soul. So it doesn't care if people lose their homes or lose their lives. It doesn't care if people are living without any roof over their head, you know, dying of starvation. A corporation doesn't care. Uh, because why should it care? It doesn't have the ability to care. It's a dead thing, you see. <laughs> but we need to take, bring those people who are behind these corporations. We need to, they need to be held accountable because they know what is going on. We have enough evidence to show that, in fact, when it comes to bank loans, that bank loans are fraudulent. We've asked questions of the banks and they've refused to answer us. You're talking about insane um, interest rates and just the way that they change their prices? Well, the shocking thing about bank loans, uh, credit card loans, mortgage loans, car loans, is that there are no loans. So that's the shocking thing to people. So when I ask you what is a loan, what would you say to me? If I say I want to loan 50 Rand from you, what, what, what it comes to you, how would you describe that process? So that means you, you, you need to have been, you have to be in possession of that 50 Rand before you can lend it to me. Is that correct? Oh, yes. you, you can't lend me something that you don't have. Is that correct? Yeah. That's your understanding of the word loan. And that's my understanding also. If I loan somebody something that means I own that thing and then I loan it to that person and they will pay, give it back to me at a later stage. Right? So I must, it must be in my possession. Um, I can't loan somebody else's stuff and I can't loan something that doesn't exist. So if I don't have 50 Rand and you're asking me to lend you 50 Rand, I just can't lend it to you. It's impossible because I don't have it, right? But that's what happens in the banking sector. When you go for a loan, the bank doesn't have the money to lend you. Now that is shocking to most people. <laughs> they think, how can they not lend you money that they don't have? Now, then again, remember I said we live in a world of deception. Things are not what you think they are. Very important to understand that. Very important. So how does it work then if a bank doesn't have money, how do they lend me money? I mean, where did I get the money to pay for the house that I'm living in? Because people will tell me, but I got the house, so I must have got the money. <laughs> I said, yes, you did get the money, but it wasn't the bank's money. Then they say, wow, that's interesting. So whose money was it? <laughs> it was actually your money. Well, in essence, you can call it your money because it was your signature that created the money. So money is actually created at the time you go and apply for the loan. So the banks don't have a pot of money there. And when you come in and say, oh, you want 50,000 rand? Let me just go to the back room there to the safe, get 50,000, lend it to you, and put it in your account and have a credit your account of 50,000 rand. No, it doesn't work that way. No. When you go and you sign a loan agreement, right? Your signature signs a loan agreement. The minute you've signed your name on that document, you've just created... 50,000 Rand, right? That's called a liquid document, a promissory note. In terms of the Bills of Exchange Act, that is money. That's a cash equivalent. You were sitting with 50,000 Rand in your hand. That has not been disclosed to you, okay? So what they do then is they do, we can call it a currency exchange type of thing. They take that, that document, which is cash, say, let's call it a type of paper money, paper currency. And we've, it's not actually money. We can talk about the difference between currency and money. It's but people, note. It's a promissory note, okay? It's an IOU, but it's a, I use an informal document. A promissory note is a proper legally binding document. So it's a promissory note. The right term is not IOU, it's actually promissory note. So they convert that into digital currency and suddenly you see your account is credited with 50,000 rand. You say, wow, I got a loan for 50,000 rand. The banks lent me 50,000 rand. But they never lent you a cent of their currency. It was currency that you created without you even knowing that. And then they loan that to you. So you're actually lending money from yourself. So you are the lender and the borrower at the same time. So I told you we live in a world of deception. Your perception is that you will lend money from the bank. The actual reality is you lend money from yourself. Is there a third party involved here? I, is this all happening between myself and the bank? Or is this between myself, a legal body, and the bank? Is there that legal... Because that seems to be where people understand one thing, but the bank is understanding something else. So they have to that note seems to be written in legalese then, right? Yes, yes, but you see, they, they apparently were given the permission to create money out of nothing. So it's not really them creating money, it's you creating money, but in essence you can say it's the banks creating money, 
creating the money. So there's no third party really, it's just you and the bank? It's just you and the bank, but there's only your signature on the, on the loan agreement because there's only one party to the agreement anyway, and, and in a contract you, you have to have two parties, you see. <laughs> Because you're not loaning from the bank, which is the second party, you're loaning from yourself. So you're loaning, <laughs> there's only one party. You see, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling stuff that's going on. And when you go to court to challenge these things, they, you will lose your home. Because the, the judiciary just assumes that in fact you lent them, the bank lent you money. It's an assumption. It's not a fact. It's not the truth. It's an assumption. But you can understand this from a legal perspective because the law works on assumption. They assume that a corporation exists. They assume it's something that exists. But in essence, it really doesn't exist. But because of the mutual exclusivity thing, it has to exist, right? So they assume it exists and it has to exist. And it's in essence, what it is, is a document, right? But assumption is a big thing in law. They just assume. And now you can't, if, I, if I'm a doctor, which, you know, and I to assume that this patient is well, he comes to me and he says, Doctor, I've got this really terrible pain on my chest. And I just assume, no, this guy has just got some psychological problem. And just give him some placebo tablet and send him home. <laughs> I'd be a really bad doctor if I did that to most of my patients. I can't work on assumption as a doctor. I have to work on fact. I need to find out what are the facts relating to this person's complaint about himself. Right? And I can only work on facts. I can't work on assumption. Apparently, the legal system is very happy to work on assumption. They do that all the time. Are there precedents where people have challenged the legal definitions and legal assumptions of the day? There must be. Yes. Um, well, look, New Era went to court. I don't know if they challenged the terminology. I'm sure they did. Um, in the UK, the British Constitution Group, I'm sure they did. Uh, but you're wasting your time, really, because, you know, the legal so system, they, they assist, they, they, they have their own paradigm. They, they operate their lives from within that paradigm, and everybody else is wrong, and they're right. And that's why I say, trying to go to statutory courts, um, you're wasting your time, really, quite honestly. We need a people's court. Very, very important. We need a people's court as a matter of urgency, I think. So what's to say that a people's court won't be any different to what's going on now? Well, it's common law is completely different to statutory law. Common law is law based on scripture. It, it assumes that, in fact, man's reason is not, is not perfect. But, I mean, I could write the... Uh, but speed. And, uh, and... I don't know, two amazing writes in this room. Yeah. How's the sound? The sound is good. Yeah? Yeah. And... Yeah, so, basically... Just come back to common law and civil law, the difference between the two. Fundamentally, the common law assumes, or maybe I shouldn't use the word assumption, but it's based on the fact that human reason is imperfect, that man, human beings, don't have perfected reasoning. And so we need to go to the scriptures, basically, and see what God says in terms of the laws that we need to live our, life, our lives by. And that is good. I, I, I think that's, a, that's the perfect way to live your life, what somebody or God, which is higher than you, tells you to do. You obey God because we're not perfect beings ourselves. Uh, whereas civil law assumes, or based on the pre presupposition that, in fact, human reasoning is perfect. And so human beings can create their own laws. <laughs> and we can see the problems that we basically created by presupposing that human reasoning is perfect, which is obviously not. If you look around you in the world today and all the problems that we are experiencing. And so, talking about problems, let's talk about the healthcare crisis. Maybe we can just touch on that now. There's, there's been, I mean, I, as I say, I've been a doctor for many years, and I've looked at this crisis unfolding. If I could ask you straight up, mm. how do you perceive the healthcare crisis in South Africa today? Paint that picture for us, and then dive straight in. Yeah. In South Africa, the, the, obviously, there's a crisis around the world. It's called the global healthcare crisis. But in South Africa, obviously, it's part of that crisis. We are experiencing that crisis also, okay? And there's many aspects to this crisis. It's, but fundamentally, it's about it's a crisis because the world is full of sick and suffering people, right? And, and the problem seems to be getting worse every year. And I've seen it getting worse every year as a doctor, and I've seen people try to solve this problem uh, from your government departments, your ministers, to your private sector, your doctors. Uh, they're all trying to solve the problem. But for some reason, they are not able to solve the problem. <laughs> and I always used to wonder, why aren't we solving the problem, you know? 
Um, and if you really fundamentally think about it, it's really not in the interest of those people who say that we must solve the problem to solve the problem. Now think about that. You know, I'm saying I want to solve a problem, but it's not in my interest to really solve the problem. How does that work? So if you look at uh, a doctor, for example, if he says, yes, we want to have a world full of healthy and well people, first of all, he'll be out of work the next day because his income depends on, the world, um, on having a lot of sick people. So there's a conflict of interest there, for example. Okay, so your doctor depends on people being sick to live, earn a living. How can he be interested in having a world full of healthy and well people? There's a fundamental conflict there. Take your hospitals. They can't say, you know, we want a world full of healthy and well people because they have no patients. Okay, take your pharmaceutical companies. They can't say the same thing. So there's a fundamental conflict of interest underlying this whole thing, you see. And so it's not an intelligent system that we're living in. We're not living in an intelligent system now. That is anti, I would call it anti-divine, anti-God, because God is infinite intelligence, okay? And if we're not behaving in accordance with what God wants us to do, which is behave intelligently, we're actually behaving unintelligently, we're creating unintelligent systems, we are going to experience problems, which, of course, it's a reality today. We are experiencing problems. So whoever's trying to solve the problem, if they're a role player, a stakeholder in the system, they immediately exclude themselves because they cannot solve the problem. They will not solve it because they have a conflict of interest.